OK, one last time. This egg is small. This egg is far away. Small, far away. So this strawberry spinach we've been growing is an interesting thing. Some of the seed companies have photographs of this in their seed catalogues that appear to have been doctored and show you something that looks more like raspberries, really glossy and plump attached to the stems. They're not really like that, at least the ones I've grown are not. However, these are interesting. They are kind of like berries. I just want to show you what I really mean by that. Uh, let's pick one that's nice and fresh and ripe looking. So, so this is what they look like close up. And if you've seen real alpine wild strawberries, they are kind of superficially similar to that. Alpine strawberries tend to have a kind of alpine strawberries have, tend to have a kind of seedy looking outside exterior. And here's the most surprising thing about these: they're juicy. So. They are like berries. It's probably going to stain my hand now. Okay, but what do they actually taste like? Well, I have tasted them already, but let me just give them, give them a go now and I'll tell you. Texture wise, identical to alpine strawberries. So juicy, soft, but slightly kind of gritty because of the seeds. Taste wise, sweet, but like beetroot. So earthy. So really strange because the first flavour note you get is kind of fruity sweetness and then there's a really intense earthiness underneath which is not for everyone but I quite like it. Okay so the question is what can we do with these strawberry spinach? Well I'm gonna pick some now and we'll see if we can figure that out. So I'm gonna snip the whole stem off so that I don't ruin them picking them out here. And that part of the stem is not going to develop anymore anyway. So we'll take that in the kitchen as is. Just to get a closer look at these again. Here they are. And they really are kind of peculiar. I really expected that these were going to be dry seed clusters like you get on Gooking Henry and other Goosefoots. But they really are kind of berry-like. And again, let's just have a look at that. What happens when you're not sure I got it properly when we were outdoors. So, there's, well, it's a it's a pinkish red juice. It's, it's definitely more beetroot than it is strawberry, but they taste initially fruity and then intensely earthy. And that's all right by me. So I think what we're gonna do with these is I'll give them a little rinse and we're going to add them to a kind of Waldorf style salad. I've got some, walnut halves here, a couple of stalks of celery, these are the nice tender stalks from the middle of the bunch. <coughs> so I'll just trim off the ends, those will all go in my stock pot. I think we'll just cut them into little dice. I want this to be kind of consistent with the size of those strawberry spinach berries. Next, some green grapes. Yeah, I think that's about the right size, quarters or thereabouts. A lot of people make it with green apples. Apparently the original version was with red apples. I'm not trying to make an authentic Waldorf salad here anyway, so I'm not too worried. But I've got a, I think this might be a Royal Gala apple, just because that's what tends to be good all year round here. So again, I'm gonna cut these into pieces that are kind of consistent with the size of everything else that's gonna go in there. I don't want any massive chunks in there. I'm just going to dump them into a bowl that's got a tiny bit of cider vinegar in there. That acid will stop the apples from browning. I'm going to dress this in the mayonnaise before I put the berries in there. So we'll have a good squeeze of mayonnaise in there. That's probably not enough. Okay, and now these strawberry spinach berries, which have been rinsed, I'm just going to pull them off and toss them on top. Now in terms of botany, it's probably not correct to call these berries. They are seed clusters of some sort but in terms of culinary use 
they're as much a berry as a raspberry as I think probably which is to say not botanically but cooks are not necessarily botanists I save the prettiest ones to the till last so we can put them right on top they do come off nice and easy off the stalk you just kind of run your finger up there and they just strip off the stalk like that so a Waldorf style salad with strawberry spinach berries I'm just going to taste a bit of this salad because I'm going to go and eat my dinner in peace let me taste a bit of this salad with those berries in it they are a fine addition to that the sweet fruity earthiness is definitely present there so just in the last six hours or so we've had an extraordinary amount of rain and this little stream which is a tributary of the river Hamble that I've brought you to before in previous videos and it's normally just a little trickle is actually kind of a raging torrent right now so here's that same location on a more normal day so if we just have a wander down here that's the normal level of water in this little stream so when we came here during the storm the water was right up over this bank here it's burst its banks certainly on this side it's up over the banks and over there it's up above the banks in several places so this little bit here well in a recent video I walked across there I walked down onto the gravel here and I walked across there and up that hill same thing for this location so there we go the water was right up over those banks over there might not be easy to see actually but let me see if I can show you the same views so that was all completely full of water and it was running up over that bank over there when we visited during the storm but now you can see in fact these are the times when the river can change its course because it's right up over the banks and it's actually cutting across there there's a meander that goes around to the left here but the river is cutting across the top of it so this could actually be one of those occasions where the river carves a new channel that's more direct than the existing one fun stuff but that water there is about probably two to three meters deep in the middle because it was already quite a deep channel here anyway that you had to go down to get onto the gravel well I was hoping I was going to be able to take you down to the bit where I pick wild garlic which is just around this corner here um, this is normally dry land today the water is right up to here how about that and similarly this is the location where I couldn't pass actually I couldn't go around this corner because there was water right up over this bank so this is the third location and this is about as far as I could come before because water was right up over this bank and I couldn't get around this corner this log is a useful reference point as you can see that's the normal water level way down there so I can't actually cut through there I was going to cut through and go down to Botley Quay and have a look down there we might try going down via the road and see what's going on down there and then down here at Botley Quay we can see the water is still rising and what is normally a sleepy tidal river here is pretty much a torrent today so in the aftermath I'm down here at Botley Mill and this was flooded so this river here came over the top of this wall if you can believe that so that river rose to the point that it spilled over the top of this wall and I've got a photograph they posted a photograph on Facebook which was taken from down here by the hidden tap and so it was a photo looking up the river there and the water spilling over this wall 
quite amazing. When you actually look at the height of the river there. And unfortunately, some of the businesses down here, the Hidden Tap, the Considerate Carnivore, have got flooded and second time they've been flooded this month. The first time was a burst water main up the road that ran down and into the mills. I suppose we should do a quick update on the plants in the garden. So my chilli plants, doing quite well now, got some chilies, look, green at the moment. Unfortunately, we had some high winds the other day and I've lost one of my plants to the high winds, but maybe it will regrow from below that break. There is a green chilli or two on that plant. So I might just see if I can harvest that one and use it green. My chili and guava has finished flowering now. And so these are the immature fruits here, already showing their little crowns that they have on the end of the fruit. Eva, don't eat bees, please. Loquat plant is doing well. These are new leaves here. It is still making some more new leaves. So I think it's going to carry on doing that. Doing really well, happy with that. Lovely flowers on the herbs at the moment. So we've got marjoram here, which the bees are really loving. Eva, don't eat the bees. This is hyssop. And that's the winter savory. And then over here, these are the other chili plants I've got. And we're doing okay here as well. So we've got lots of green immature chili fruits. They're all kind of long and pointy ones at the moment. Different shapes. I think that might be one of the bird chilies. But they're doing okay. Just got to kind of leave them alone and hope that they're going to ripen. Hope we get enough of a summer from now on for these to ripen fully. Strawberry spinach all but done fun fact this plant here which I told you was sun spurge is actually called petty spurge everything else I told you about its toxicity is the same but I actually got the species wrong it's petty spurge not sun spurge I've got in my garden kind of kind of the same story either way though don't get it on your skin definitely don't eat it I think I might actually cook myself a lunch with some of the things from the garden so I've got a regular onion that's not from the garden that's just a thinly sliced onion then I've got these green chilies and these are the ones from the plant that unfortunately got blown down by the recent weather. No idea how hot that is. Shall I try a bit here and now? Let's try a bit of that on its own. Oh boy, that's hot. Wow. Straight away. Let's get all of that in there then. I've got a bunch of chickweed here that I picked from the vegetable patch. This is weeds, but I rescued them before Jenny got there with the weeding. I've given it a really, really good wash and I've double and triple checked it for any intruders, which in this case would be that petty spurge. I'm just gonna run the knife through that to break up any long fibers. The stalks tend to be a little bit stringy, but they're just fine when they're chopped up like this. So that can all go into the bowl. And almost the last of the strawberry spinach. Now what's interesting here is, look at all those little seeds in the bottom of there. I think I might tip them back on the garden and we'll probably find that this stuff will just seed itself and grow again next year. But I'm just gonna pull them off and throw them in as well. When they're so ripe like this, they come off so easily. But you can see the colors starting to come out of them already onto my hands, but not to worry. And while we're here, I'll have some fresh basil from my windowsill. This is now, I think, about the fifth or sixth iteration of this basil. So I'm just gonna pinch out the tips of all of these shoots here, and that will cause it to bush out, and we'll get more stems growing. This doesn't even need washing, it's, just, it's been growing on the windowsill in the kitchen, and it's very clean. So I'm not even gonna bother washing that, but we'll chop it up. Add that in as well. So onions, chilies, strawberry spinach, chickweed, and basil. What we're gonna do with this is make fritters.
So we'll have a couple of tablespoons, like maybe four tablespoons of gram flour, that's chickpea flour, probably one tablespoon of self-raising flour, and then some of my kind of favorite spices. So we'll have a spoon of just regular sweet paprika, half a teaspoon of garlic powder, nice generous teaspoon of cumin, and just more for color than anything else, we'll just have a little pinch of turmeric in there. Mix those things together in the dish there to start with, because what I'm gonna do here is add all of that in there dry to this bowl. So this bowl's got all of the vegetables in there, and these are, some of these are quite wet from washing. So that lot's gonna go in there. And before I add any more liquid, I'm just gonna see how much of this is taken up by the liquid from the vegetables. Definitely needs a little bit more water. So we'll just add a little splash of water in there. Just really enough to bring this together. You can see it's coming together on its own already. Tiny bit more water. And that is about what I wanted to get to. I will actually put a bit of salt in here. I was going to wait until we get it to the table. Actually, I think, do you know what? I think would be nice in here as well as a bit of curry powder. A bit of this Lion brand curry powder. I love that pattern. Just add a bit of that in there as well. So it's quite a lot of spices for a smallish amount of vegetables, but I think it'll stand it. Those leafy things kind of stand up to fairly robust seasoning. Okay, and I'm just going to do this by hand. I'm just going to take little handfuls of this and dump them in there like that. Just so I can keep it nice and clumped. Well, that already smells really good. Okay, I think it could be time to flip them. I probably need another flip before they're done. But let's just give them a flip now so that we can flatten them on both sides. That's good, looking very good. Right, I'm gonna turn the heat up now so that these start to crisp up on the outside. It's gonna give those a taste. Okay, mostly homegrown garden fritters. So let's give them a taste. I've got some of my odds and ends pickle here. So let's have a little taste of these fritters. Well, on their own first. Oh, that's good. It's really sweet, actually. I think it's the um, strawberry spinach has really come through on this. Let's have a taste of that now together with some of my odds and ends pickle. And so just to look at these, they're kind of crispy on the outside, but lovely and doughy and steamy on the inside. Really nice. I'm not sure if it's the curry powder or the green chilies that's giving these a bit of heat, but they're just a nice medium sort of chilli heat in there. That'll do me very nicely for lunch, I think. Every now and again, I like to do something I think I'm gonna call bottom feeding on Amazon. Okay, mine's out of the gutter. By bottom feeding, I mean sifting through the dregs that sink to the bottom of the pile. Once in a while, when I have a bit of downtime that I can't avoid, like if I'm waiting for a video to render or if I'm on hold on the phone or something like that, and I've got the computer running, there's something I like to do, which is I fire up Amazon, I type in a search term, usually something quite simple, and then sort ascending by price, and then spend a little bit of time sifting through loads and loads, pages and pages of irrelevant trash, trying to find a really low priced bargain version of whatever it was I typed in. Often there is nothing to be found. Sometimes you find things that look like amazing bargains, and there are several reasons for that. For example, this flash storage, two terabytes, is priced low because it's a scam. This product is not two terabytes of flash. It's spoofed, it's a scam. I've got lots of other videos about that. There also used to be a thing on Amazon where two sellers would compete against each other. They'd have automation in place that would underbid the other seller. So if one of them dropped their price, they would drop their price to a penny less. And it used to be the case that sometimes you'd find those algorithms competing against each other and you get a kind of race to the bottom effect. Both of them price their things down to a penny and then somebody comes in and orders it. And if they're lucky, they get something that's quite expensive for a knockdown price. And of course, simple human error. When people are setting up new products, sometimes they set them up with the wrong price. Sometimes they put the decimal point in the wrong place. 
all those sorts of things. So you can end up with products on Amazon that are underpriced for what they are. That little projector that I bought and reviewed a little while ago, it's not very good, but it should have been about £50. Anyway, I was doing that the other day and I came across an Android tablet priced at 10.99, and it's not a brand you recognize, but it does actually look like quite a good spec. And for 10.99, that's a bargain price. So of course I ordered it. What was interesting was that there were two color variants of it. There was a pink one for 10.99 and a black version for more than hundred pounds. So anyway, I ordered it and sat back and waited. And here's the parcel, it arrived today. It's got a battery marking on it, so it is electrical, gotta say, I don't think there's an Android tablet in there. It doesn't feel like it weighs enough. I think this is going to be one of those liquid crystal drawing tablets, pressure sensitive drawing tablets, but we'll see. The moment of truth. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. So, so it's not a, it's a borderline electronic device. This it's a liquid crystal display but it's not uh, an addressable matrix display. It's a pressure sensitive liquid crystal thing that you draw on and the pressure creates the picture. And then when you press the button, it applies a current to it and that resets the whole display to plain black. Well, I think we should probably have a look. I am gonna send this back because obviously it's not what that was advertised. Well, they got the color right. It is indeed pink. And yet there it is. So the way these work, they are, as I say, electronic, barely, but there's like a film of liquid crystal in there that is reset when you press the button. It's not an addressable screen. It's not, it can't be connected to a Raspberry Pi. It can't be saved or anything like that. The image on there, all you can do is draw on it with a pen, which is fair enough, you know, and then erase it. Quite an interesting bit of technology. Not worth even £10 now. You can pick these up for about three or four quid, but um, not obviously an Android tablet. So I will be reporting that to Amazon and asking for my money back. Okay, small update. When I went to raise my dispute on Amazon, I saw that there were several other people who've already complained and said that they got this instead of an Android tablet. So several other people also bottom feeding like me. This is something I'm gonna do again, bottom feeding on Amazon, and maybe sometime in the future, we'll get something that's a bit more interesting than this. I'm gonna upload this video before I know the result of my Amazon dispute, but I'll put something in a pinned comment if there's anything interesting. But I think we can assume I'm gonna get my money back. Here's an interesting thing I've been seeing this year. It looks like a hornet, but in fact, it's a hornet mimic hoverfly. Quite a large hoverfly, around about two centimeters long. So down here on the south coast of England, these are visitors to the UK, and they come across from the European mainland, typically in warmer summers. They look and behave a lot like a hornet, although they are completely harmless. Although it's fair to say that a genuine hornet probably won't harm you as long as you leave it alone. You're actually much less likely to be stung by a hornet than a common wasp, just because Hornets are not interested in the same things we are, whereas common wasps will happily seek out and compete with us for the things that we like to eat, like jam, for example. Anyway, there it is, the Hornet Mimic Hoverfly. A few people have asked for details about how I made the video for Bernard the Extraordinary Moth, so I thought I'd show some of that today. Please do be aware though, this isn't a tutorial, because if you're intending to learn any skill from scratch, my approach is very often not the best one. It's just what works for me. I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by that later. I wrote the story of Bernard the Moth quite a few years ago, actually for an art project for my daughter, Steph, who was at uni at the time. She needed to illustrate a story. She didn't have to write the story itself, so we looked at some of our favourite stories, but those were things like Dr Seuss books, where it would be very hard to improve on the illustration that's already in place there. So I wrote this moth story, which is kind of based on scientific observations. This was inspired in part by the fact that I really do like moths. The story outline flowed onto paper in less than half an hour, and I did tweak it a little bit more over the next couple of days, but it was more or less in the form I used in my recent video. These framed paper cutout pictures are part of Steph's project from the story. And I've wanted to present an animated version of this story ever since I wrote it. Only recently, when people have been asking me more and more to read books, did this kind of come back onto the agenda. Anyway, let's take a look at how it all came together, remembering of course that none of this is necessarily the right and proper method. I wanted a colour scheme for the animation that was sort of like The Wizard of Oz, but in reverse. In my case, starting with a vibrantly colourful setting and moving to an increasingly drab and grey one, that's the way the story works. I thought maybe I'd hand draw all of my scenery and assets, but that turned out to be really, really hard work. I didn't get any further than finishing the drawings of my peppered moth, and I realised I'd have to do something to accelerate this whole project. 
I did think about cutting the assets directly out of photographs. There's a studio called Amanita Design, which I think has used this kind of method for some of their games and animations, and it's a very lovely look. But I wanted something with a bit more of a hand-painted storybook feel to it. Style transfer to the rescue. This is where a machine learning algorithm learns to separate the style elements of an image as distinct things as apart from the content of the image itself. This style can then be applied to other images. It's a really fascinating field and it's also the technology that's behind the website This Person Does Not Exist, which I've used in the past. If you want to learn more about style transfer, I recommend the YouTube channel Two Minute Papers. It's very fascinating. Anyway, I used a website called neuralstyle.art, which does cloud-based style transfer as a service. You only get a couple of tries for free, but the pricing after that's really reasonable. I paid $12.99 for 400 render credits, and I only used about 250 of these credits for the whole project. And that included a lot of experimentation with styles and images that I never actually used in the final project. My photos and images came from various different sources. I painted the peppered moth wings and body myself, then scanned them in. I used quite a few free stock photos of forests, trees and houses, towns and factories from pexels.com as well as some photos of tree trunks and branches that I took for myself while I was out walking the dog. I ran the forest photos through a neural style transfer using a sort of painted canvas style, and the pictures relating to the town were style transferred from a stock photo of an industrial chimney belching black smoke. So as I've been showing you, the way that neural style works is you feed it an image that you want to transform, then you pick a style, there's a built-in gallery, or you can upload another image and have it derive the style from that. And then there are various options and you submit and it renders your result. So, you're wondering what happens if you feed it an image with the same source and style. Well, me too. Here's one I tried using the stock photo of a teacup and a plate of biscuits, styled using the same image of a teacup and a plate of biscuits. The result's not exactly the same as the source picture. You can see some artefacts here and there, but it's not very exciting. Maybe if there'd been more self-similarity within the image, we might have seen some weirdness, but maybe not. OK, and what happens if you give it a really disparate style to apply? Well, here's one where I gave it a row of trees and asked it to style that with the tea and biscuits image, and we get this, which is interesting. It costs just one render credit to try any of this, and the result is a lower resolution preview. This can be then re-rendered at a higher resolution for another two credits, cheap enough that playing and experimenting is perfectly possible. Then I used an image editing program to cut out the trees and other images and save each of them as transparent PNGs. My image editor is called Photo Impact. It's obsolete and discontinued, but I have a lot of invested experience with it, so I still use it along with other things like Paint.net. I probably won't switch away from Photo Impact until the day comes when I have no choice. Now let's take a look at creating some simple animation in DaVinci Resolve, starting with the simple stuff, a sort of pan shot in the forest. Now it is worth noting DaVinci Resolve is really just not intended to be used for this kind of animation, but we will talk about that in just a bit. So I add an image for the background, zoom it a bit, that gives me some wiggle room to move it around. Then just add a blur because it's the background. Now lens blur would be best, but that's not available in the free version of Resolve, so a Gaussian blur will do. Now I'll drop one of my cutout trees into the layer above, and we've got a forest scene. To animate this, I just arrange it in the way I want it to finish up. Then go towards the end of the scene and set keyframes on the position of the two assets. Then back up to the start of the scene and move those assets a bit to create some fake parallax. If our imaginary camera is moving sideways across the shot, things that are near will appear to move faster than things that are far away. So we move the foreground image a lot and the background image just a bit. That's what that zoom was for on the background. We can move the image in frame without revealing the edge of it. Because we set that keyframe at the end of the sequence, moving the objects at any other point creates keyframes at the playhead cursor point. And DaVinci Resolve does all of the tweening. That is, it assumes we want those things to move smoothly between the two keyframed positions. And that looks like this. Kind of job done. I did the same sort of thing with the smoke and chimneys, except for that one the foreground object wasn't a cutout. It was a full-size image of clouds. I laid it over the top of the chimneys and dialed back the opacity a bit. Then I played with the different compositing modes. Subtract seemed to be the right one, and then job done. Smoky clouds moving over a background of smoky chimneys. OK, but sliding images around isn't really animation, is it? So let's take a look at animating the moth, which I wish I'd screen recorded as I did it, and I'll have to redo it now. So for simplicity and ease of viewing, I'm going to recreate it using shapes that I just roughly cut out of images of fabric and wool and other stuff. The moth for this demo is going to have an elongated body and a head, separate antennae, and two pairs of wings, four wings and hind wings. As I add each one of the moving parts in, I'm moving their anchor points. When I switch on transform view, you can see the anchor point here. This is basically the pivot point for that object. If we rotate or scale or otherwise transform this image object, it will happen around this pivot point as the center. And I can use the same images for left and right wings just by flipping them, although this doesn't flip the anchor point, so I have to reposition that. Then I'll scale and place each of these individual images to assemble the moth. 
in the timeline, anything that's on a layer above something else will overlap it visually too. So the forewings are above the hind wings, for example. Now I need to animate the moth to make it flap its wings, for example. But first, I'll just make a copy of it and throw that over here. To animate the flying, it's just a case of setting a keyframe at the start and again at the end. That means whatever we do in the middle, it will all move back to the original state. So in several stages, the flying motion is just going to comprise of the wings drawing up. So I'll shorten them in the x-axis only. Unlink the X and Y zoom to do that. You might think it would be better to use the Yaw function for that, but here's what that looks like if you do it on a smallish object. Next I'll have the wings rotate back a bit, then I'll just let them kind of sweep back to their original positions and squash them a bit in the Y axis. I can't remember if this is exactly what I did with Bernard. In fact, here's what Bernard looks like when the wings are flapping. It seems to me there ought to be a way to mirror those keyframed movements onto the matching pair of wings, but I couldn't figure that out. You can paste attributes, but you can't paste mirror. So I just transposed them manually by copying numbers from one box to another, making them negative in the x-axis to switch them from left to right. This all works because at present our moth is centered exactly in the frame. And maybe we want another animation of the wings folding from the extended position, so I'll take another copy of that original moth and just keyframe the wings all rotating down into a sort of folded pose. Okay, that's great, but at the moment these are all just messy collections of pieces. If I wanted to move this moth around or rotate it, all of the pieces will behave somewhat independently. So I select them all and then create a compound clip. Now this segment of moth animation, one beat of the wings, is one thing. We can move it around, scale it, rotate it and so on. More importantly we can copy and paste it, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. Okay, so let's create a scene. I want my moth to fly diagonally up the screen, over a brick wall and then land on the wall somewhere up at the top right. So I add the wall, zoom it a bit and keyframe the starting position, then the position where it will stop. Now my moth, it's going to be flying all the time the background image of the wall is moving, so I'll paste in a whole line of the wing beat animation pieces to fill that amount of time. I'll change the speed of those because they were incredibly slow when we were animating them, so I'll just speed them up so they look a bit more realistic. And I'll use some different speeds so we've got kind of irregular wing beats. Then after the wall background has stopped moving, the moth is going to land and fold its wings. So I paste in that sequence, and then I've also cut off the bit of the still version of the moth at rest, didn't show you how I created that, but it's the same methods and just the antennae are moving in this one. So I'll paste in a bunch of those segments to fill the rest of the shot. Now we have a flapping, then folding and resting moth in front of a wall, but it's right here in your face. I want it to be smaller and to move about. So I select all of the moth segments, which are compound clips already, and combine them into another compound clip. Now it's one object, but still doing all of the motion stuff of all those individual parts. Keeping them all separate right up to this point enables longer or shorter sequences to be exactly constructed as required. So now I can scale it appropriately, setting a starting point for movement and set an end point to, and that looks like this. Which is a bit boring, so I'll drop in a couple of additional position keyframes and have the moth sort of meander up the frame. I can keyframe the rotation too, which will help with that. I'm also going to add a drop shadow effect. And I can keyframe the drop distance too, and the blur and the angle. So it looks like the moth starts away away from the wall and then lands right on it. And we'll probably stop there. Hopefully you get the idea. That took, what, five, ten minutes to create. And here's what the scene looks like in the final render. So at this point, people with skills in Adobe Animate or After Effects or Maya or Blender or Synfig or whatever may already have put their fist right through the screen at my bumbling, clumsy methods. And those people are not exactly wrong. But let me explain why I always seem to do things the wrong way. For me, a lot of it's about expediency. If you're intended to learn a brand new skill, that is a skill that already exists in a well-developed form and others have already pioneered it, there's at least two different approaches to this. My way and the right way. The right way is probably something like researching the skill, looking at the way other people do it, taking recommendations for tools and materials, then acquiring those tools and materials and maybe getting some training, and learning to use them in the proper way. This way you get to completely avoid some rookie mistakes just because you're following in the footstep of people who've already made those mistakes for you and can wisely guide you around them. This approach works, it's all good and proper, it's the right way to do things, I, I can't criticise it. And if you acquire a new skill in this way, if we were to kind of plot attainment or output over time, it would probably look something like this. There's a phase where you're spending a lot of time and effort just getting started, learning the absolute basics, but your output is actually quite low. All of your attention and effort is invested in learning the skill itself rather than being productive. A little bit later on, you get into your stride and suddenly there's a sharp increase in your attainment and output. You become increasingly productive in the skill and you reach a sort of competence level. 
Eventually this levels out when you've become fully competent using the skill, or perhaps even mastered it, and you can do pretty much anything that anyone can do with the skills. And in the case of very talented individuals, there's a further phase where you're not only competent in applying the skill, but you're kind of elevated to a level where you can contribute and advance the development of the whole genre. You can perhaps do things that nobody else has done yet, or you can design new tools to do things. You kind of mastered the skill, and then as a master, you're leading the way. And I'm going to say that's probably the right way to learn a skill, if you desire to master it, and in particular, if you want to specialise. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this approach. I won't say a bad thing about it, but this isn't how I do things. Mainly because the idea of specialising and focusing on a skill, and then doing that thing forever, sort of scares me. I've never really known for sure what I wanted to do with my life, except that I didn't want to just do one thing. There is an idiom that fits here, which is jack of all trades, and of course the normal corollary to that is master of none, but I'm okay with that. My approach is more like jump in the deep end and thrash about a bit, try and get started. When you have to drive a nail, any tool is a hammer. This approach has some very specific advantages and disadvantages. If we plot the progress of this one on the graph, the attainment curve probably looks something like this. There's a much steeper climb in actual output, because nothing's actually being worked from scratch. However, the curve flattens off at level lower than when you do things the right and proper way. And most critically, there's no direct path from one to the other. In fact, habits and methods you might develop when you do things the organic, self-taught, quick and dirty, jack-of-all-trades way may very well be significant obstacles to you if you ever do want to start doing it the proper way. So the purists, the experts and the masters will tell you that you should never do things my way. And remember, I'm not recommending anyone else should do what I do. This is not career advice. But there are two other lines I need to draw on this graph that apply to me personally. One of them is this horizontal line called good enough. It represents the attainment level that's good enough to be useful for my intended purposes. Now, some might say that by aiming for good enough, I'm lowering my sights, and that's absolutely true. But as they say, perfection is the enemy of good enough. Good enough is good enough. The other line is this vertical line called soon enough. That is, how long will it take me to reach the good enough state? And these two factors are really, really important to me. Time I could spend trying to properly master one activity is time I don't have to explore ten other things. I don't want to stay in my lane and just do one thing. So my preference is always just to bumble through it, learning as I go, and where possible, transferring and exploiting existing skills and experience and tools. As I say, it's not a useful direct route to true excellence, but it works for me. And the scenery on this windy back road is a bit nicer than it is on the straight path. And because I'm not pursuing a singular skill-focused career, I do actually consider myself incredibly lucky to have found an audience for this sort of nonsense, which has enabled jack-of-all-trades to kind of be my job now, because it always was my vocation and calling, I think. As I say, though, not a recipe for career success. Stay in school, kids! So I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.